Um, we're going to come to the preach uh, in a moment. Amanda's coming to preach with us, uh, preach for us. We're just about to enter into a new series. It's called Little Big Things. It's about the little things that can make the big difference. Okay? And um, so Amanda's going to come and speak to us. Amanda, thank you uh, for bringing the word this morning in advance. Um, it's great that, the, that Amanda and Jason and Ta- uh, Talia have come to uh, come to Mosaic but recently just got off the air um, off the uh, aeroplane I know they, that Amanda was with us last week but we had a lot of people in last week but today Amanda's come to speak to the house this is a message for us guys so you know as Amanda comes up to speak give her a great rapturous round of applause and let's let's go for it let's go for it come on just play for me It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you for being up here with me. Y'all ain't ever up here with me, so this was this is special right here. Y'all gonna work with me today? Is that what's gonna happen? Ah, don't worry. You got the back end of the service, buddy. You're coming. Don't worry. You let me get there. We'll get there. It's so delighted. I'm so delighted, obviously, to be here. For those of you that were not here last week, we just want to tell you how much we love you, appreciate you. We're so glad to be back in the house. We're excited about what God's doing. Amen. I, every week, I drive the ring road of Coventry for one purpose. Now, I don't, I don't always drive it for one purpose, but every week we make a, a decision to drive the ring road, and we just pray over this city. We drive all the way out on, uh, I guess it's M4, around to Warwick and Lymington, up through Sully Hall, because I believe that God assigns voices to a region. Okay, well, I'm going to have to preach on that, apparently, in order for all of us to catch that. He assigns voices to a region. In other words, your voice doesn't matter in every, in every environment. You're not a wife to someone in every environment. You're not a CEO in every environment. Just because you are in one doesn't make you true in another. You have to know how to discern the environment you're in and where your voice has been assigned, where authority is assigned. And whenever God has brought us to this area, I felt that God assigned our voice. It was for a specific purpose. There was an authority that God wanted to give. And so one of the ways you access authority in the kingdom is through prayer. The Bible says that we have a mediator who makes intercession for us over things that we don't understand. So you access authority first and foremost in prayer. So as we pray, we just begin to declare over this city that God is giving us this region. Now, I don't want to be the only one out there praying for this region. And you know, you say, well, why is it that God gave us a city center location? Well, I'm just going to take a couple seconds on the front end of this. Is this okay? Can I just talk to us for a minute? Can I just talk to us as a church, as a family? We were sitting last week in a great conversation with some people around a table, and, and they said to my husband, well, why in the world would you buy a city center location? City center locations are going out. Nobody wants to have the parking issues. Nobody wants to deal with the walk. And it just hit my heart like in one of those... Um, holy discontentment kind of ways now maybe you don't have that but as an american i definitely got that where i just wanted to say about five things and the holy spirit said don't say any of them and i said to the lord lord i want to say the right thing here and jason responded and god bless that man and his very graciousness because I wanted to say well why don't you just come and let God show you what he's trying to do you know sometimes you got early adopters and then you got people who come along on the journey and I think that was the type of person we were talking to but God just prompted me when we were driving this week and said Amanda we're it's not about the convenience of the location it's not about making it easier having more seats having more prominence of a view it's about the reclaiming of a territory that I always said was mine. And I've just been looking for a people who would be willing to tap into what it means to restore. Not everyone will take the time to build on a foundation. There are lots of people who are willing to lay foundations, but there are not many who will come and build on it. And there's a process of building. And I think we've been assigned to Coventry, not just to this building, but we've been assigned to be builders and restorers of this region. 
I didn't live here during the war. I didn't live here in the times that I know devastation hit this area. But I will tell you this, God is about to do something that reverses the curse that's been placed on this region. And he's gonna use us to do it. And so I, I felt in my prayer time when we were developing the sermon series on where we needed to go over the next couple months to finish the year, I felt that we needed to do two specific things. One, we have to understand how to enter a new season. We don't always understand that there is a proper way to enter a new season. You don't just show up into the new season. You have to learn how to enter it. You have to learn how to understand the qualifications and the criteria that God requires for you to enter that season. Whenever you find in any chapter, any time of transition in Scripture, the book of Joshua is a great example of this. They never just went and took territory. They went and took territory with instruction. There's always a way to enter. And there's also always a way to exit. There's always a way to exit. In the same regard, the children of Israel were given instruction on how to leave Egypt. Now, I'm not claiming Egypt and the Promised Land are our examples, but I'm using it to help set us up. That over the next four weeks, I believe strongly that God wants us to learn how to enter in properly. He wants us to carry the right context into where we're going. Because listen, God isn't interested in us taking the old address into the new location. There's nothing worse than having someone move to a new house and you keep finding them at their old address. God's trying to advance us and move us into something new. And when he does that, he gives us instructions on how to do that well. But he also gives us instructions on how to leave well. So this is why you have this today. Now, there's a, a few doubles on here on this 15 items for Christmas. There's more than 15, and there's a few that apparently they were so important, they got doubled up. But here's why we're doing this. This this year is not about collecting items for hampers. I need to, I need to explain something. This, the Sunday, December the 12th, is the absolute last Sunday we will be meeting as a church on a regular basis in our Hope Center location. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring items, whether it's in cash, whether it's by card, whether it's in physical form, we're going to bring items because we're going to end that season well. You say, well, well, why would we bring these things? Because what we're doing is we're transitioning that location from being our primary home of Sunday mornings to now being our complete seven-day-a-week outreach center, where it will minister to people seven days a week. So we're going to leave well. So what we're asking you to do is on the 12th, you can do it any time before, but there's something significant about us doing it on that last Sunday that we're actually at the Hope Center, bringing these items along so that we finish one season well and we walk into our new season, leaving where we've been blessed. The Bible says that even the Israelites, when they left, they were commanded to bless. Even when you find Abraham has blessed both sons, the Bible said he blessed both sons because there's something about the blessing being left. So we're going to bless with items and we're going to enter into our new day under the criteria of that blessing. Amen. Do you believe that with me? So we want to make sure that you have that with you. Today I want to just start into what I believe is over the next four weeks specific things that do matter to our ability to enter well. The first Subject I'm taking on today, I'm calling the unhindered heart, the unhindered heart. If you would, would you just turn to me in script, with me in Scripture to Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17. You let me know if I need to move around up here, guys, or if I'm doing okay. Luke chapter 17, when you get there, I'm starting in verse 11. If you would, with, just stand with me for the reading of the word as it is my tradition. Luke chapter 17. Now before I read that, and I didn't want you to have to go to two places today as I took you last week, I'm gonna to read Psalm 100, 
real quick, and then we'll turn over to Luke 17, verse 11. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Now turn over to Luke 17, starting in verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So that when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that they went and they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice he glorified God. He fell on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. He was a Samaritan. Jesus said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the other nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except the foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Lord, thank you for the ability to preach and teach today. Thank you for your word that is illuminating. It's life-giving. It's revelatory. Thank you for the privilege to communicate your heart. Make my tongue like the tongue of a ready rider, that I might communicate your heartbeat, that I might say what you have to say to your people. And Lord, unlock eyes today and unlock ears that we might hear and see you clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to take on the subject, the unhindered heart. But the first thing I want to do is help to establish why this is so important, important about entry points. I read Psalms 100 for a purpose because Psalms 100 says, you enter his gates with thanksgiving. What that means is, is that you actually, you and I actually have a way in which God wants us to do things. Do you know that you and I don't get to worship God just in any old fashion the way that we decide to? The Bible Bible is very specific about things that God requires of us in order to give him proper worship. You say, well, that can't be anywhere in Scripture. Sure it is. Have you ever read about Cain and Abel? Cain offered his best, but it wasn't the best that God asked for. And as a result of it, God couldn't bless what Cain offered. We all know the story where Cain offers the best of the land. He wasn't even assigned to the sheep, but Abel was assigned to the sheep. And Abel brings the sacrifice of a, of a sheep and a lamb to the, the presence of God to offer sacrifice. And Cain comes with what he believes is best. But the Bible says that when Cain brought his best, that the Lord looked at him and said, I don't know this best. I don't understand the aroma you're bringing me because even though you thought this was your best, this was not my best. This is what, not what I asked you. And so one of the things I think we have to sometimes reconcile as Christians is that just because we have the ability to praise God, just because we have the ability to be grateful, doesn't mean that we're always grateful in the manner that God requires of us. He said, when you enter my gates, when you get through the place of my gates, you have to learn how to offer thanksgiving then. Now, gates are really important in Scripture. You'll look all over Scripture, and you'll find out that gates were the place that decisions were made. Whenever you saw someone sitting at the gate, it was to be an indication of the elders that would sit there and make decisions on what happened inside of a town. That's why when you read Matthew 16, and you hear the conversation between Jesus and Peter, where Peter says, you know, you are the God, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus looks back at him in Matthew 16 and said, and this revelation I will build my church so that the gates of hell cannot prevail. Why does he use gates of hell? Because what he was saying was not just the entry points, but the places of decision. Your revelation is so good, it's so robust, it's so understood that even at the place of where evil is trying to decide some things, 
I am going to give you authority that even in those places, you will not have prevailing an enemy against you. So when we come into Psalms 100 and we start talking about thanksgiving, when the word of the Lord through David is, you shall enter my gates with thanksgiving, what he's first trying to tell us is, is that in every place where decisions are made, every place that you have authority, every place where you believe you have the right to do what you want to do, every time you come into any situation in your life, you have to learn how to start that situation in praise to me, in thanksgiving to me. You enter my gates. You enter into my atmosphere. You enter into my decision making through your gratefulness and through your thankfulness. And when we're going to go into this new season, we have to realize that in order to get there, we have got to learn how we don't have to be primed by three songs before we're willing to raise our hands and say thank you to Jesus. (laughs) You don't have to have great worship to say thank you to Jesus. I'm pretty sure that most of you, if you're Christ followers in here, you've had enough happen if God didn't do one more thing for you, that you have enough reason for now until eternity to say thank you to Jesus because he brought you out of places you didn't realize you needed to be brought out of. He took you out of situations you could have never gotten out of on your own. He allowed you to come into a world that you did not deserve, that I did not deserve. So Thanksgiving should be an automatic, but yet we struggle because what happens is, is what we get life in between our first encounter with God and our living life with God. And we end up living a life like Luke 17. And I want to break down four areas today that I believe gratefulness has to reside. It has to have a place in our life. Here's the first one. Gratefulness always has a memory. This is what the Bible says, that as the leopards came, they were not healed when they asked Jesus to heal them. This is one of the areas of Scripture where you will see people leaving Jesus' presence still the same as they came. They left unhealed. They were healed along the way. And this is what I want to say to you. When gratefulness has a memory, if you'll notice, the Bible says that all 10 of them were healed, but only one of them made a roundabout turn to come back and give any thanks to God. What I find in the body of Christ is that all of us pray and say, God, will you touch this situation? God, will you do this? God, will you move these barriers? God, will you open this business opportunity? God, will you make a way on my job? Will you touch my children? And God begins to do something, and then what we do is we go on with life, and we never make the U-turn back to where Jesus is at to let him know how grateful we are, to remember what it is he's done for us. Every year, my husband, for the last last six years, we have one day, March the 7th, that we celebrate what we call Life Day. Because six years ago, my husband almost died in a car accident to the point that I was on my way in a two and a half hour drive. There was no way to get there quicker, no way to cause anything to happen faster. I will never forget the, the, uh, the doctor calling and put him on speakerphone in my dad's truck. And he said, you will not make it before your husband passes you won't get here in time. And I remember sitting there and thinking, Lord, this cannot be happening. We were too young for this. We haven't done the things I know that you've assigned to us. I know that there's more. And and we probably had at least a 90-minute further drive to make it anywhere near the hospital. And the doctor said, we're taking him into surgery, but you probably will not make it. He will not be alive. You need to prepare yourself. And I remember showing up to the hospital, so, they were so convinced he wasn't going to be living that they did not even let me come in through the hospital entrance. They made me come in through the morgue. And they told me, they said, your husband is going to be down here. By the time you get here, you should park on that side of the hospital. And my dad was with me. And I can still remember saying to my dad, I don't know what's going to happen, but I just, I just don't want to lose sight of how good God is to us. I don't want to lose sight of what it means to to worship God in the midst of it. I got down to the morgue and I asked for my husband's name and they said, well, he hasn't been brought down here yet. So we phoned upstairs and and the doctor said, you can come up. And as soon as I got up there, he was hooked up to a thousand things and and you could see him through the window. And and the doctor met me outside of the room and he said, I'm just going to pre-warn you. He's not going to make it through the night. I'm not sure how he's made it this long. 
And I, every place I went was another testimony, another memory trying to convince me that there was no way the man that I loved, that the God that I served was going to bring us out to a different place. And I remember my dad standing there, and of course we did what every person who's a Christ follower would do. We, we began to pray, and we began to just intercede, and I began, I went to the chapel, and I just did what I know to do, which was to clear my head and say, Lord, you got to show up. I don't know what else to do. you got to show up. Every doctor doesn't believe it's going to happen. Well, you clearly know my husband's sitting in front of you today. But every year, it took us several years to get to the place we are now, but every year on March the 7th, we take a day with our family. We don't take a day with our family just to go to the zoo or to go hang out somewhere or, or just to go be together, even though none of those things are wrong. We take a day to go backwards. Do you want to know what that leper did that day? The Bible says he made a U-turn. He went back to the place that he found him at Jesus. He went back to the place the miracle took place. He was not afraid to let his memory lead him. When was the last time that you and I told our testimony so in depth that we went back to the place, that our hearts were warmed once again with that feeling that, God, you're the only one who could have done this? Do you know the testimony you have is not so that you can hide it under the bushel? It is not so that you can never say it again and only use it to your advantage to be able to advance your cause. The Bible says that the testimony you have has been given to you in memory so that you will allow yourself to carry a grateful heart. The unhindered heart has to have a memory. Every March 7th, Jason and I take our children without fail, and we put them at the place that we believe is an altar in our home, and we offer praise to God. Because there is no way that we could have done anything in that moment. I'm not just not a physician. I have no ability to have caused collapsed lungs, multiple surgeries, backs that were out of order, memory loss that was never supposed to return, breathing that could never happen, hair loss that wasn't going to happen, walking that couldn't take place. I could have never restored that. Right. And every year we say we will allow our gratefulness to have a memory. I'm challenging you that you've got to let your gratefulness once again have a memory in your life. Some of us need to make some U-turns back to the place where we found them, the place that we know He made a way for us. It's, this is one example, but for you, I know you can think of the place that you had no other response but to have God meet you there. Thank you, Mark. Man, it's like a, like a God on fire right there. Thanks, buddy. It'd be great if you could open that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just fooling around. That is the place that gratefulness has to have a memory. Do you want to know that what separated that leper that day? Do, leprosy automatically makes you disjoined from your family. He probably had not been with his family for many years. He'd probably not seen his spouse for many years, his children for many years. They stayed together in colonies together because that became their family, because they were unable to be with other people. There were 10 that went, but one said, I'm not going to go to my family first. I'm not going to go back to the things that I missed first. I'm not going to go to the things that make me happy first. I'm going to go back to the one, to the source that brought me out. Your gratefulness has a memory. Second thing is your gratefulness always has an unhindered response. Responding to God is part of gratefulness. Listen to me. Now, I'm going to get challenging here for a minute, if you don't mind. I wore pink because sometimes when I wear pink, I feel like I can say hard things. <laughs> I've been in the culture long enough to hear this multiple times. Well, that's just not how the English are. We're just not expressive. <laughs> and yet, I watch your football matches. I watch your cricket matches. But it says we're just not expressive. Gratefulness doesn't know anything but expression. When you know that someone did something for you that you could have never done, when you realize that you were lost and now you're found, Gratefulness always has an unhindered response. 
As soon as that leper came back, the Bible didn't say that he said to the Lord, well, do you think I should uh, go to my family now? Do you think I should spend time with other lepers? Do you think I should start a ministry? Do you think that I'm now a businessman? First thing out of his mouth was, I just laid at your feet and said, thank you. I just said, thank you. Gratefulness doesn't have to be coaxed because it always knows what something has been done for them. Yeah. It has an unhindered response. Let me give you two examples in scriptures real quick that counterbalance one another that I think will help make this point. Most of you probably don't read Song of Solomon on a regular basis, but Song of Solomon chapter five gives us a great understanding of what it means to have a love relationship. If you ever read Song of Solomon, you'll understand that it's between Solomon as king and a Shulamite woman. But God uses Song of Solomon to illustrate the, the church and God himself. It's a love story between the church and God, between the people of God and himself. And when you look throughout all of the chapters leading up to chapter Chapter 5, you'll see this love story taking place and probably terms analogy that you're not used to where it talks about how much the church has yearned for him. And as a female, she has longed for her beloved and she has looked for her beloved. And then we find out in chapter 5 that here is the woman, the Shulamite woman, the woman who represents the church where she has gone to bed. The Bible says in chapter 5, read, learning up to chapter, uh, to verse 5, that she had gone to bed. The Bible says she undressed herself, washed her feet. She was laying in bed. And then the beloved came. Sorry, guys. Then the beloved came. And here's what the word of the Lord was. She says of her beloved, though she wanted him badly, though she wanted and longed for him, when he showed up, it was outside of the convenient time she was looking for him. And when he came to the door, the Bible says that she, he knocks on the door in chapter 5. And she says to him, but I've washed my feet. But I've undressed. But I'm in bed. Why do you come now? When I was ready for you, you didn't come. But now I've done all of the things. And I don't want to get back out of bed. But then she realizes, well, I better get out of bed because this is the one I love. So when she finally makes the decision, the knocking stops. You can read this for yourself in chapter 5. The knocking stops. And this is what the word says in verse 5. And the doorknob dripped with myrrh. Myrrh represents bitterness. She went to the door, but she went bitter. She went to the door, but she went bitter. She had lost her desire for the one she loved because she was no longer willing to be inconvenienced over her response. Wow. She responded, but her response was hindered. She no longer was willing to have God wake her up in a place that she wasn't ready for him. Let me tell you something. True gratefulness, real gratefulness, it doesn't matter if God comes and knocks at midnight, if he comes at 2 a.m., if he comes at 5 a.m., if he comes at 4 in the afternoon. Your heart is yearning and ready. If you've taken your shoes off and you've gotten into bed, you're willing to be inconvenienced again because you're so in love with the one in whom you have said. Here's the key. All through chapter 1 through 4, she declares her love for him. But when it came to a time she was no longer ready for him, her true colors showed. She loved him with mouth, as Matthew 15 says of the Pharisees. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. When it comes down to the rubber meeting the road, yeah. they're no longer willing to be inconvenienced for me. And when they do, they become bitter. Let me challenge us today. Yeah. There are people that come to church every single week, but they don't come happy. They don't come full of joy. They don't come full of that desire to change their life. They don't come believing that they're meeting their beloved, the one in which they have been longing for. They come out of habit. They come out of expectation. They come out of religious activity. 
instead of believing that there is a God who is waiting to meet them on a regular basis. And do you know who should know that more than anyone? Is you and me, because we've had a taste of the beloved. We have to learn how to allow our gratefulness to once again have an unhindered response. That's why I'm not afraid to raise my hands in church. That's why I'm not afraid to get into an aisle. That's why I'm not afraid to sing loud. It's not because I think those things make me a better Christian. It's because those things are the things that I want to give back to a God who has been so good to me, who has brought me through things I could never do, who has healed my children in the middle of the night, who has saved me from things I had no idea were coming against me, who brought us out of situations and saved my husband. It is not an obligation. It's a privilege to honor him. We have to once again allow our gratefulness to be unhindered in response. Number three, gratefulness always has a return. Gratefulness always has a return. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that when the leopard returned, he glorifies God. And then there's something interesting that takes place. You can go back and read it again for yourself. Something interesting takes place because Jesus says, where's the others? And he said, they didn't come. And then he looks at the leopard and he says to him, your faith has made you whole. Or in some translations says the word healed again. The word healed, that he was healed on his way to show himself to the scribe is a different word than the word healed that's used at the back end of the scripture in verse 19. When you're talking about them being healed on their way to show themselves to the priest, that word healed means cure. He was cured. He was made well. Everything that was physically wrong with him was made well. But the word healed on verse 19 is a different healed. It's the word sozo, S-O-Z-O. It's a Greek word, and it means to be saved. It's soul health. It's when your soul is damaged and your soul has been restored. This is what Jesus was saying. He was saying, I have no problem healing symptoms. I did it for 10 of you. But because one of you was willing to come back to me in return, I'm able to not just heal your symptoms. I'm able to restore your soul. Your gratefulness to other people and your gratefulness to God can bring restoration to your soul. Listen, God is not as interested in physical healing as much as he is in soul health. Your soul is where you make decisions from. It is your mind, your will, and your emotion. It's how you process. It's what you process. It's how you see life. It's how you decide right and wrong. It's what makes decisions with you and for you. And what Jesus was saying to that leper that day, he said, you came and thought you were only giving thanks to me over a physical manifestation. But what you are walking away with is the manifestation of a different you on the inside. Listen to me. A grateful heart that is unhindered can always receive more from God than whatever it is you are asking for. God is always healing the parts of you you did not even know you needed healing from. He wants to restore our soul. That's why David said, Rejoice, return to me the joy of my salvation. Take me back to a place that I can remember what it was like to be dead and unable and unalive. Take me to that place again, Lord. Return to me that feeling because I don't want to just take from you a physical manifestation. I don't want just a better job. I don't want just a better attitude. I don't want just everything to go right. What I'm looking looking for, God, when I return back to you, is that you will open my life to change me from the inside out. Gratefulness is always changing you from the inside out because it's healing your soul. Gratefulness always has a return 
Do you know what we need to have redeemed again in the body of Christ? We don't need to just have a redemption of people getting saved. The Bible says Jesus said, I am the door. He did not say he was the whole house. He said, I am the door. That means that there is a house to be explored. And the word of the Lord to us is, is stop stopping at the door, being willing to say, that's a nice door. That's a pretty door. I'm worshiping that door. Jesus said, you are using the power of who I am wrongly. If all you do is stand at the doorway, learn how to walk through the door of my life into the house I have for you. Because in this house are many rooms. In this house are many places. I want to restore every little thing about you. The way you treat your spouse, the way you talk to your employees, the way you deal with your children. I want to begin to restore those things in you. And as you allow gratefulness to rise up in you, I'll begin to shift things in the atmosphere of your life. I had a, many of you know I'm a female. People ask me all the time, what's it like being a female in the ministry that I do? Now listen, there's lots of females now and I'm thankful for that. But when I first started, I didn't know that you could be a woman preacher. I thought you had to marry and be like a co-laborer with your husband. That was the only way you could do it. And I remember saying, I don't know how these things that are in my heart are ever going to come about. And I can remember one time I came to a meeting with my father. And when I was there at the meeting, a man walked up to me. And he's a very, very well-known man. A man I truly respected. A man much older than I. And he said to me, he said, I know you're preaching tomorrow night, but I'm not coming because I don't believe women should preach and they shouldn't instruct a man. And, you know, I was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, I got it. Pin four, good buddy. And I remember walking out of that meeting at first and, and really honestly dealing with this sense of anger in one moment and then a sense of frustration and then almost this sense of inadequacy. Like, God, maybe I am fighting an uphill battle. And I can remember the feeling that I had. And the Lord gave me one instruction. He said, if you see him in the hotel, thank him for his comments. (laughs) Now, maybe y'all don't know me very well. (laughs) But humility without a reason does not feel right. And I thought, I'm not thanking that man for what he had to say to me. He's out of his mind. I had 14 verses on how this isn't right. I was ready to take him for an hour long ride down the scriptures. And the Lord said, I'm going to give you an ability to see him. And when you see him, walk up to him no matter what he's doing and thank him for his comments. And so I tried to avoid all people in the hotel. True story. My dad and I were together. My dad went down to breakfast. He said, are you coming to breakfast? I said, no. I thought if I don't eat breakfast, I have a better chance. Sure enough, true story. My dad said, well, we're going to leave it this time. And I knew I was speaking that morning. And I, I jumped on the elevator. I was on the fourth floor. I was on my way down. The elevator opens on the second floor. And a man in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt gets in. And it's this gentleman. And the door closes, and he was very, you know, cordial, and I was slightly cordial. And I, I, I looked at him, and I, I, we were on our way down, and I knew I only had a minute. And I looked at him, and I, and I called him by name. I said, you know what? I want to thank you uh, for your comments to me yesterday. And I think he was a little stunned by it. And I said, I just, I really feel like I should thank you for that. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with me um, and just being real. I appreciate that. And he looked very confused. And we get down to the first, the the ground floor. And I get off and he gets off. And I know he's now we're headed towards the meetings. And my dad and I got in the car and we rode off. And I'll never forget, we were in the middle of this great hall. There were probably 500 pastors there. He was a main speaker for this. And he had decided not to come. And about halfway through my session, the door over on the left opened. And he walked in to the auditorium and he sat down. And I can still remember the Holy Spirit saying to me, it was your gratefulness that brought that return. Your willingness not to fight the wrong fight. 
your willingness to humble yourself made room for him to get it right. The return from your gratefulness is his soul health. As a result of it, at the end of the meeting, he came up to me. He never apologized, but he said a very kind thing to me about my sermon. And ever since then, I've never found him to leave any meeting I've ever been a part of. I'm not telling you that because it does anything for me. But my ability to be grateful brought a return. Gratefulness can't be just to God. It is almost always through people. You have to learn how to be grateful to others. And your gratefulness to others shines before the gratefulness to God. It brought a return. It's healing souls by you being willing to be grateful. Not just your own, but those that you're grateful with. Number four, I'm rounding the corner so you can come on, Scott. You can play for me. Number four, gratefulness has a sound. Gratefulness has a sound. Now, this is important to me, and I felt this week when I was praying that I specifically wanted to linger on this point for a moment. Because sometimes we think that praise and worship is, is really optional. If I want to praise, if I want to worship. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that every person who was ever touched by God, no matter what their circumstance was, they all had the same response. In fact, so much so that you'll read in our text, Luke chapter 17, where he says, where's the other ones? Was there not 10 that were healed? Why is it that I cleansed 10 and only one was willing to come back? Why is it that 90% of those that I healed couldn't say thank you? Because the truth of the matter is, is that most of us, if we're honest, Sometimes we use God to the advantage of what we need instead of the relationship we should be forming. God's not Santa Claus. He can do it. He can bridge whatever gap you need. He can change things for you. He can make a way in the middle of a desert. He can cause all types of incredible miracles to come to your life. But he doesn't do it so that you can have a miracle. He does it so that you can know the relationship. So that relationship leads you, not the miracle. Gratefulness has a sound because, see, listen, I'm telling you the story of Jason today because it, it matters to, to my sound. Because in, I can remember in the midst of that moment in ICU, walking over to a little chapel much like a leper who had had God do some miraculous things, Jason had made it up to then. My dad said, what are you going to do in the chapel? I said, I'm going to worship. Because at the end of the day, whether Jason lives or this is his time, whether everything goes the way I hope it goes, or this is the end of the end on this planet, the sound I make is setting the atmosphere of where I live. My sound, my tone. That's why you don't tell someone you love them like this. I love you. Thank you so much. That's why when someone says to you that you really care about, I love you, you don't just stare them in the face and say, thank you. Why do you say, I love you too? I'm in love with you too. Why do you do that? Because gratefulness has a sound. When you're grateful, your tone changes. Everything you're about shifts. And for me, I've learned that the sound of gratefulness in the body of Christ is the sound of worship. It's the sound of adoration. It's the sound of praise. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 50 that the praise of a man unto the Lord glorifies him. The word glorifies there is the word kabod. It's a Hebrew word. 
It's an important word. It means weighty. It means to place the right weight on the right person. The word weight there is not weights as in making them heavy as much as it is placing value on them. Every time I praise him, I'm shifting the value from my problem, from my circumstance, even from my miracle. I'm shifting the value. See, listen, the value of the miracle is not in what I got. The value of the miracle is in the one who gave it freely. I shift my weight from being over what I got to what now is all his anyway. I'm going to take you to one scripture. You can mark it down so you can read it later because it will change your life. Romans chapter 15, verse 9. Read the whole chapter when you do this in your devotions this week. This is Paul. Paul is writing to the Gentiles, obviously, in the book of Romans. He's talking to them. And he's telling them all about what Jesus did. And he says something so potent. He says, Jesus so much wanted you to know the goodness of his God, his Father. Verse 9, that he sang it to you. For all of you who don't believe Jesus sang some things, I want to help you. In fact, if you look at Jesus on the cross, when he's saying, my God, my God, why are you forsaken me? That comes from one of the songs of ascent that would be sung up the hill to Jerusalem at Passover. Most scholars believe that while Jesus was dying, he was singing over you and I. The Bible says in Romans 15 that it was his song of praise that brought the Gentiles to know him. You want to know what your praise is doing? It's shifting the atmosphere around you. That's why when I walked into a little Baptist chapel at a Baptist hospital, I just started to say, I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praise is to your name. You know why? Because I needed to shift the atmosphere. Because my gratefulness has a sound. At that point, it wasn't enough just to not sing that sweet song. To tell him I loved him. Because gratefulness comes with a sound. Jesus saw the sound as being the place of breakthrough into a whole group of people. What you don't know is happening is opening up your life because it has a sound. So here's what I want to do. I know that the way that we're going to go into, into our new season is with the sound of gratefulness. We're going to carry gratefulness as our sound. We're not going to carry war because we're not at war. Victory's already been won. Are there things that we need to have shifted? Yes. But Jesus said, when I came, I came in song. Because I want you to know my gratefulness, my praise has a sound. So would you do something with me? Will you just stand with me for a minute? Let's bring the sound. You say, this is uncomfortable. Good. It's uncomfortable, but it's necessary. Let your gratefulness have a sound. Let it have.
first love because listen to me we're not going to change this region you're not going to change your street you're not going to change your home off of yesterday's memory only you've got to restore the joy of your salvation so here's what we're going to do we're going to worship one more time if you don't know Jesus we want you to know him I'm going to give you a call and I know God's dealing with you right now he wants to make a difference in your life today. I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of this service. If you're feeling warm, that's a good indication something's happening. That this is your moment. You want to know the God that you can be grateful to. But secondly, for those of us who are Christ followers, I'm believing that in this next time that we worship, God is about to bring us to an unhindered place. Do you hear me? We're not going into our new season walking under hindrances. We're breaking the glass ceilings and we're walking into now an unhindered worship with our unhindered heart. So let's lift a sound to the Lord in gratefulness. Let's just give them our best.
that you're walking us into a new place, that we're returning to give thanks, that our gratefulness has a memory, and we're responding to you. Now, if you don't know Jesus in this room right now, now's your chance. I would have no better privilege today than to lead you to Christ. Right now, all over this room, on the count of three, I want you to have the courage to raise your hand because I've prayed for you. Courage is coming. One, two, three. If you want to know Jesus, raise your hand. I want to lead you to Christ. Thank you. Thank you. All over the room. All over the room. Thank you. Lord, right now, we're just going to say a prayer. We're going to ask you to say this prayer with me. And as we're done, we're going to worship our way into and out of today, okay? Would you just repeat this after me? Jesus, I recognize you as the son of the living God. And I'm receiving you into my life. As Lord and Savior, I repent for my sin. And I thank you that you're giving me new life. I recognize that you today were raised on the third day and you now live in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Now let's worship. Let's worship our way out today. Bible says in Numbers chapter 6 that a pastor has the authority to bless the people. So today I bless you. I speak the favor of God over you. I declare that you are blessed coming in and going out. That you are the head and not the tail. That everything you touch this week will be prosperous and that fruit will remain from every endeavor. In Jesus' mighty name. We love you. Be blessed. Have an exciting, excellent week.